the Lion King soundtrack is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. And like the Lion King soundtrack makes massive use of that as a technique, especially in the song He Lives in You, which a lot of people don't know about. So the song He Lives in You is shown at the beginning of, Lion, of the second Lion King, but it's also, it's also sung as a part of Lion King on Broadway. And it's such a powerful song that one of the things I've always aspired to do is at least again, sonically, is to, is to like envelop the room in the way that that song, when it comes on, totally like takes up space in the room. What's up, everyone? I'm Zach, and welcome to the Augzoro Podcast, which is inspired by, but not limited to, the curiosity of myself. Whether I speak with doctors, designers, athletes, or music artists, the goal is to improve my own way of thinking and hopefully help others think better themselves. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you'd like to keep up with all things Augzoro, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to our twice monthly newsletter. In this action packed email, We send you the latest Auxoro content, as well as articles, podcasts, books, shows, and other content we find exciting and useful. Go to Auxoro.com or visit the link in the podcast description to join over a thousand others who get the newsletter. Also, you can now support Auxoro on Patreon for two, five, or $10 per month. On Patreon, you get early access to all podcast episodes, discounts on merch, and one Patreon-exclusive episode each month. We're an independent platform with no outside investors, and we rely on listeners like you to keep the conversation going. Go to patreon.com forward slash Augzoro to become a patron, and thank you for your support. This time, I sit down with Chloe Valdery a writer, activist, and founder of The Theory of Enchantment. The Theory of Enchantment is a course designed to equip students with the skills necessary to develop a healthy sense of personal empowerment and social well-being in both their private lives and society at large. And the course is heavily influenced by pop culture. In this episode, Chloe discusses how music has influenced her thinking, why she views social media as more than just a tool to create content, what makes East of Eden one of her favorite books, the methods behind the theory of enchantment, and more. Without further ado, please enjoy this deep dive with Chloe Valdery. I thought... A good place to start this conversation now that we're through the the malfunctions, get the get the hard part out of the way. You are a music producer and a DJ by night, according to your Instagram bio. So <laughs> for people who may not be aware of your musical skills, what got you into DJing? What made you want to produce your own music? So that's a really great question. Uh, I moved to New York almost five years ago, and I moved to Brooklyn immediately. I've always lived in Brooklyn when I've lived in New York. And some of my friends from time to time would take me to these DJ parties at places like House of Yes, which is a famous, pretty famous club. I was there a few months ago. Nice. A lot of girls in cages that night. (laughs) I I guess it was a theme. So House of Yes is a very eclectic, uh, interesting space. Uh, it's not your typical club. It's not like, mm-hmm. you know, going to, I don't know, Lavo or your typical like club in Manhattan. It's very artistic and um, odd in some ways, but it also has really awesome DJs. And one of the DJs my friend took me to see was this DJ named Tasha Blank. And what she did with her sort of, what, what she did with her approach was she created, I think, a meditative space. Um, and she sort of curated a very meditative space that was perfect for dance and perfect for music in a way that was very different from like the hyper materialistic settings that a lot of clubs have when DJs perform there. How was she creating that meditative space? I'm just curious. What what was different than the average DJ show that she was doing? So she runs this thing called the Get Down. And that's like the name of her set. And she performs like once every two weeks. 
And there are a couple of rules that animate the get down. So one of the rules is there no, there's no drinking on the dance floor. Uh, there's no phones allowed on the dance floor. And there's also a rule to respect your space and to respect everyone's space, everyone else's space. So like that she's already setting the tone for, you know, consensual dancing with people and stuff like that. But in yeah. addition to that, she also, before she starts every set, she like tells the audience to close their eyes and she gives like a little speech for about two to three minutes to really set the tone. And then from there, she goes into her set. And the set is like two hours, two to three hours roughly. And it's before the typical time you would expect people to go out. So it like starts at seven and it ends at nine on a weekday, mm-hmm. usually on Thursday. So it's not, it's not meant for like, going out and getting wasted it's meant for having a time to dance that's that still enables you to go to sleep and wake up the next day for work but it's still like a pretty transformative experience yeah i was gonna say that's cool because it it fits into the nine to five schedule and i love going to bed uh, by 9 30 during the week like i'm i'm sitting in my bed probably 9 30 9 45 yeah. most days and there are a lot of shows that i want to go to during the week that whether they're at Brooklyn Mirage or or sometimes Terminal 5. And it's always usually doors at 9, doors at 10. And then the person will come on around 11 or midnight. So I like that she has that 7 o'clock start time. Yeah. And also like a lot of clubs and bar spaces aren't doing anything during that time. So it's also an opportunity for them to make money as well. I like the no phones thing too, because I've noticed that increasingly artists seem to be asking people to put away their phones on stage or to the best of their ability, just try to be present during shows, which artists really didn't have to worry about 20, 30 years ago because no one had a phone until the late 90s. But now I I have seen a bunch of artists from all different genres that will say, even at shows that I've been to, you know, for these next three songs, please put away your phones or just don't take any videos these next 10 or 15 minutes. I just want you to experience that connection. And I, and I really do feel like that adds to it because if you're worried about recording the show, then you're not really connected to the music. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I know I recently saw Jadena, the Nigerian artist at Brooklyn Steel and my phone was dying. Like, you know, there were the pre, pre-shows and my phone was sort of like, on its way out. And I could have kept turning it off and turning it back on to preserve the battery in order to capture footage when he came on. But I decided to just turn my phone off entirely and have it be off for the entire concert and to just be present in that moment. And I think part of our obsession with having the phones out is rooted in our fear of like impermanence. And I didn't want to contribute to that fear. So I decided to just you know, just turn it off and just be grateful for the experience as it was happening in the present, as opposed to having this need to capture it and be be able to look back at it. Yeah. And, and I realize myself getting caught up in that sometimes when I'm recording the show. So now a lot of times I'll just record for maybe a small segment at the beginning, post a story, save a video, send it to my brother or whatever. Because when I'm posting five or six songs from a show or if, if I want to put them on, as an Instagram story or whatever, I know people aren't watching it because when I go on Instagram, the first thing I do when I see someone posting from a concert after the first one and I see eight more stories, I just swipe through it and I'm just like, <laughs> I don't need to That's so watch true. this. So in my head, I'm like, why am I even posting this right now? After the first one, people are just going to skip through it. Yeah, I do like to sometimes capture it for my own, you know, so for my own look back, not necessarily for Instagram. Mm-hmm. So I do sometimes think to myself, oh, it would be nice. It would have been nice to like have some footage of that to do a concert that, just in my phone that I could look back and like yeah. enjoy again. Ultimately, I think this practice of not having the phone on is a good thing. I mean, obviously I can turn it off from time to time. It's so funny. I was at a birthday party yesterday and I put my phone away And I really wanted to like take pictures, but I also didn't want to have my phone on me. And so my friend was like, oh, you can just use my phone to take pictures. And that could be like a happy medium, (laughs) you know? So that was really cool. And then she just sent them to me later because I just didn't want to like feel compelled to have it on me. I don't like that feeling more than I 
don't like the feeling of not capturing moments in photographs. That's funny. I, I was just listening to a podcast with the author Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you've ever read anything yeah, of course. by Ryan Holiday. Yeah, so this is the key. Yeah, yeah. So he, yeah, it was actually a, a podcast focused around that, but he he went into some other aspects of social media too. And I, and I think the name of the podcast is Short Story Long for anyone who's interested in checking it out with Ryan Holiday. But he said that one of the things he does to prevent himself from using social media when he's out is that he keeps his login on his wife's phone. So he downloads... He doesn't keep the app on his phone. He puts the apps on his wife's phone. And whenever he wants to post something or whatever, write out a tweet on Twitter, he has to ask his wife, hey, can I use your phone (laughs) to post something on Instagram? Which he says filters out the things that aren't really important because he's not actually going to bother his wife when they're out or if they're just hanging around the house, like, hey, give me your phone because I need to post something real quick. It kind of puts it into perspective. How bad do I really need to post this? It's an interesting approach and it's an interesting question, right? Because like as people try to get their content out there, obviously being on social media is a part of that and part of raising their profile. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if your profile is that of a person focused on health and wellness, then it's sort of a double-edged sword. Because to a certain extent, the obsession with posting contradicts the, the message that you're giving. I also recently, a friend, actually not that recently now, but a friend told me a couple months ago, so he suggested that I delete the Facebook app. So in order to go on Facebook, I had to literally pull it up on like, you know, the Safari browser on my phone, which does, I've noticed, limit the amount of time I spend on Facebook drastically. Yeah, I started I started doing that with Instagram. I'll I'll download Instagram at the beginning of the day mm-hmm. if I want to post something and then after I post it, I delete it and then if I really want to check it before I go to bed, I can re-download the app. But then I was also doing the same thing where I was going to Instagram on my browser to check it. Yeah. So if I really don't want to even be tempted, I kind of like child lock my phone with the adult uh, browser. Okay. <laughs> it's like you can sw- you can switch on the adult browser to include social media sites or whatever, like any adult site, and it won't let you go to Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. So if I really feel like putting myself in timeout, I can do that. Oh, well, that's so interesting. I it's interesting because like I don't really feel like I have a problem with Instagram. Meaning, if like out of the three main platforms that I use. If I were to describe any of my usage as problematic, I would define problematic as just slightly excessive use of, and the platform would be Twitter, but and not Instagram. I use Instagram mostly for entertainment purposes, Mm -hmm. not for like anything related to necessarily like expanding my my reach or profile. Although if that happens, great, you know. But I mostly use I mostly use Instagram to like watch funny things or like watch music videos that pop up on Instagram. Um, but Twitter, it's, it's, it's difficult or it's challenging just because Twitter, my, my usage of Twitter actually has led to like an expansion of my profile. And so I could make the argument that the use of it is necessary for just like career wise, but also just mm-hmm. to keep in mind that like everything should be used in moderation. So it's, it can be challenging to strike that balance. But I know if there was any, if there was any like platform that I would need to delete because of the problem of overuse, it would likely be Twitter. I don't think I'm at that point now where I'm overusing it, but I can imagine it coming to that, you know, to that situation. I got on Twitter recently too, or I've been on Twitter for a while, but I recently just started using it more. And I definitely have garbage time on Twitter where I'm not learning anything. I'm just going through bullshit to (laughs) go through it. Or like, if I want to be agitated, I can find the things that will agitate me. And if I want to look at puppies or whatever, I can, I can do that too. But the one thing I have realized about Twitter is that I feel the, the highest rate of return, or I guess the most effective yeah, rate same. of return. Same. Because I can curate my Twitter feed to what I want to see. So 
I try to do it with things that are helpful or inspiring or, or sometimes people that make me uncomfortable, not in like a bad way, but oh, that's not my view, but this person is interesting. So I'm just going to follow them and see what they write. And then when I want to write something on Twitter, it forces me to actually sit down and think, how am I going to say this in 240 characters? So I think it, it makes, it's a good exercise to kind of take a thought and then tr- try to Twitterize it, I guess. To be concise, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I agree. I think Twitter has been, has given me the most return also. That's why, that's why I have to be cautious with Twitter because it's like the most likely to become problematic because it's given me the most return. So as a creator yourself, and, and you create a lot of great content that I enjoyed going through Thank you. to prepare for this podcast, how do you view the kind of dichotomy of social media as a tool versus using it to engage? Because recently I've been thinking about this a lot. If I, if I purely use social media as a tool to push out content that I create mm-hmm. or my own thoughts and just delete it after that or kind of disconnect, then it feels a little bit dishonest to not kind of engage what people are saying or or maybe respond to certain people. How how do you navigate the the pushing of your own content with engaging what people have to say? So that's interesting. So like in thinking about a lot of social media as a tool to simply create content, I don't necessarily think of social media primarily as that. Like if you were to ask me about GarageBand, which, you know, Steve Jobs made sure to put on every Mac for free. I think that that's what I think of when I think of a tool that's primarily used to just push out content as opposed to like engaging with responses to Mm -hmm. the content. Whereas I think social media by its very nature is built in such a way that you're supposed to engage with others. Like to not engage with others after putting out, let's say a thought or you know, an essay or some sort of long form content, written content is to sort of defeat the purpose of social media, I think on some level, because the the social aspect is like a part and parcel of it. Now, at the same time, you have to know like when to ignore certain (laughs) engagements that come in your, that just come in your headspace that are obviously like trolling or, you know, dysfunctional or negative. You have to learn how to block those out. And also when it comes to things like Twitter, What's relevant to that is, like you said earlier, curating it so that you can curate it in such a way that, so that the negative and the trolling aspects are less likely to occur anyway. But I think that engagement is part and parcel of like the social media experience. Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this episode real quick to let you know that Auxoro also produces a short form podcast called The Ox. The Ox brings you a daily dose of uncensored wisdom to jumpstart your life. 10 minutes or less, no bullshit. No topic off limits. You can subscribe to the show by searching The Aux, A-U-X, wherever you listen to podcasts. For all the latest Augzoro content, you can follow us on Instagram at at Augzoro, Twitter at at Augzoro Mag, and hit us up for our twice monthly newsletter with the link in the podcast description. Now, back to the episode. Yeah, like a, like a two-way street. And you're right. I guess the question is, how do you filter out the trolls from people who genuinely want to engage. Cause I guess there's really no way to do it purely because you're always going, if you don't respond to anyone at all, then you're going to shut out both types of people. And if you respond to everyone, you're going to let in both types of people. So I guess it's a balance. So I only really engage with people on Twitter. I used to engage more with people on Facebook, but I'm just off of Facebook these days or I'm I'm not on Facebook as much as I used to be. So Twitter is the platform where I engage people the most. And Twitter is actually pretty fun. I have a lot of fun on that platform even though a lot of people in my <laughs> in my mentions are always complaining about how depressing Twitter is. I think it's in part a product of that curation piece that we talked about. But in terms of like uh, having a barometer, I think that over time you can tell sort of like who's being genuine, even in the tenor and tone of their disagreements versus who's being just an asshole. I think it's easy with time to discern. It's also important to like 
check upon yourself and see like what mood you're in and see if you see if you're not or ask yourself if you're not projecting that mood onto other people which is easy to do obviously for platforms like Twitter where you're not engaging face to face with a human being you're literally just engaging with text and so you can you can like take the mood that you're in let's say you're feeling like really i don't know angry at something that happened earlier to you and then you can take that and project that tone of voice into something you're reading on Twitter. And as soon as the person is asking you something or disagreeing with you in a very mm-hmm. anger, angry manner, but in fact, you're just projecting the feeling that you have onto that, onto that tweet. So th- that's one of the things I try to keep in mind. If I assume that someone is trolling, is it valid or is it because I'm bringing in to the interaction and emotion I felt that, was, that has totally nothing to do with this interaction? A lot of people just troll for the sake of trolling yeah. and their entire accounts that are based on that premise. A lot of, some of them I think are really funny, like a lot of uh, comedians or maybe some political commentators that are, just have an account for the purpose of trolling other people or ideas. And then people respond to them as if it's not a joke, which makes me realize that Twitter is not real life. Because yeah. like there, there's so many responses where if I see, you know, if Ricky Gervais makes a joke on Twitter and someone takes it literally, I'm like, how do you, like you follow <laughs> Ricky Gervais, you know, he's a comedian and you know that his number one priority is to say funny things. It's to make yeah. people laugh. And so he's going to use whatever he can to do that. It's not just a thing that you have feelings for. He does that with everything. Yeah, that's also something I've noticed myself doing lately on Twitter is let's say that something t- someone tweets out something that's insane and it goes really viral. I and then it makes me angry for some reason. I I find myself stopping to pause and just asking myself, "Wait a minute. Is this bait?" <laughs> like yeah. am I supp- am I is it really necessary that I respond to this? Like this is going to be over in 24 hours. No one's going to be talking about this in 24 hours. So to remember the fickle nature of a lot of these things is also key in discerning who to engage with and, and who not to engage with and also what to engage it with and what not to engage with. Yeah, it's good that you create that space to realize, you know, is what is this person really trying to say or, or are they just projecting? Because a lot of people don't. It makes me think of the, the call-out culture or a lot of companies or prominent figures that are quote unquote, canceled on Twitter for various reasons, some of them just, some of them unjust. But I feel like now, if there's not already, there should be some type of training for any, say someone on Wall Street, like a CFO is in the public eye and he's on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There should be some type of social media training where like, okay, if you get called out, this is what's going to happen. For 24 to 48 hours, your life will be absolutely fucking miserable. Yeah, And then three days later, no one's going to give a shit. So like in those 48 hours, don't destroy your reputation by giving in if you genuinely think you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. I, I also, it's, it's hard, right? Because like a company could reasonably decide to just tell their employees to not be on social media. <laughs> and on a certain level, that sucks because they should, they arguably should have the right to be on social media. Social media is like universally accessible to all. But at the same time, if you want to control, you know, the reputation of your company and not have it be given to the whims of employees who perhaps should not be on Twitter during work hours anyway. I don't know. It's hard to like develop policy around that. But if you are going to allow your employees to be on Twitter, at least like if you're saying that, because I think it's reasonable to say you should not be on social media during work hours if you are in fact working for a company like, you know, something on Wall Street. but if you do allow your employees to be on social media during that time, I think it's reasonable to have bylaws in place that regulate the behavior of your employees because presumably they are spending work time on being on social media, right? And I don't know that that's, um, I don't know that any company would see that as, as, as reasonable, but also at the same time, companies as a whole need training and understanding that like that exactly what we're talking about, the fickle nature of, of tweets, because what companies sometimes do is like, there's a whole 
you know, hullabaloo over one employee that says something silly. Um, and then this, this employee's reputation gets tarnished. But what the company doesn't realize is that it's, it's done in 24 hours, right? And by assuming that the implication is far more, like the implication of that tarnished reputation is far more serious than it is, the company is exacerbating the problem. So you need, you need multiple levels of training, both for the employees themselves and on a company-wide level. For company execs to realize that like not everything that seems like it's a big deal on Twitter is actually a big deal, but also for employees to realize that maybe don't go on Twitter <laughs> during the work hours. Yeah, because at, at a certain when, once you're at a certain level, I'm sure if you do a cost benefit analysis, what's the the benefit of being on Twitter as a prominent figure who's not making their living as an influencer or a celebrity or something like that, the the benefit is severely outweighed by the cost of getting drunk one night and tweeting out something that's stupid and not being able to take it back. So it's like how I think you just have to evaluate to how much is my life being changed by being on Twitter and is it worth what I'm getting out of Twitter for me to be on it? Yeah. And if it is worth it, then you might be in the wrong industry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess <laughs> might, so. That's, that's another might, problem. You might not. Wall Street might not be like the right job for you. Something I wanted to ask you, you mentioned in one of the your previous podcasts, I think it was on Dave Rubin, that the book East of Eden is one of the most important books you've ever read. And I'm always looking to add to my reading list. So so for you, what made it one of the most important books you've read? So I read East of Eden in 10 days, which is pretty short for a book of that size. Um, and that just, I think, tells you how riveting it is. Um, or gives you a glimpse into how riveting it is. But East of Eden is fundamentally about fathers and sons. And a lot of the tensions that arise between fathers and sons, and also sons and their brothers. And the this impulse that young men feel in trying to live up to the vision that their fathers have of them, and how that can sometimes overtake them, or how they can sometimes overcome that that tension with the blessing of their father. And so East of Eden is about three generations of fathers and sons dealing with that. And also brothers dealing with the, the weight of their father's sort of gaze, if you will. Um, and what happens, for example, mm-hmm. when a father articulates that he, not necessarily verbally, but in action, articulates that he loves one son more than he loves the other son, right? And if the second son is constantly vying for the approval of the, of the father, and is you know that obviously leads to a lot of jealousy and bitterness and resentment between the two brothers and like and like the implications of that for the family the implications of that on society itself is what East of Eden taught me and because I could take those lessons and apply it to I could see those lessons at work in real life between fathers and sons and between brothers um, and it was so in that sense it was super important in giving me a window into the inner lives of human beings that are navigating this particular issue. And there are so many human beings in real life navigating this particular issue. And they, might, they may not like, be aware of it or articulate it in this way, but so many, I guess you could say, so much bad behavior often comes from this dynamic. And East of Eden taught me that. The dynamic of sons trying to prove themselves to their fathers and then the opposite fathers maybe not communicating good values to their sons is that yeah and this this seemingly eternal like quest for worthiness that sons are always looking for in the eyes of their fathers and especially you know so then to think about what happens when the father isn't even present in the son's lives um because the fathers in east of eden were present in the son's lives they just didn't necessarily behave properly or didn't necessarily pass on the right values to their sons. But to extrapolate from that and think about the level of, or the the sense of a lack of worthiness that a lot of young men are dealing with because of absentee fathers, that's also something I learned on an emotionally visceral level from reading this book, as opposed to like 
oh, giving me stats and figures and data points to demonstrate, you know, how many people are dealing with it. This book captured the emotional feeling of what it's like to deal with that, which I think is, you know, important in thinking about society at large and, and carving up potential solutions to these types of challenges. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to check it out because I, I have two brothers and a father. So mm-hmm. I guess that checks all, yeah. <laughs> all the boxes. But yeah, I, I, do, I do take for granted a lot, especially now that I'm getting older. I'm 26. Same. The oh nice yeah yeah so I was gonna say I, I take for granted having a great father and mother mm-hmm. and just growing up in a two parent household mm-hmm. because that was kind of the norm in Plainview Long Island mm-hmm. basically the the whitest most Jewish neighborhood you could think of people called it Plain Jew okay and my mom is Catholic and my dad is Jewish so I was raised. Catholic because of it was on my mom's side, but basically everyone I hung out with had a two parent household, mm-hmm. and I didn't really start hanging around people that weren't raised by two parents. At least at the start, divorce happens and things like that. Mm-hmm. But until I started playing baseball with people of all different backgrounds, like from the Dominican Republic or inner city thing like that, and then eventually when I got into podcasting, so I just realized more and more how much of a how much influence growing up in a two parent household, especially with a great father figure, had an impact on my life? Yeah, it's pretty daunting psychologically to think about because when you think about how many people, or just if you were to guess how many people, let's say, living in America alone are experiencing this psychological dynamic, it's like it becomes very taxing for me to think about the psychological toll and the amount of people affected by the psychological toll of that. And then to think of solutions is like also a challenge. But yeah, I think East of Eden helped me develop a greater sense of empathy for for that. It's also like about human choice and the fact that like the fact that we have the choice to behave in a way that reflects absence of a a good father figure, but we also have the choice to behave in a way that reflects just choosing the good despite the fact that that father figure was absent. That's a theme that's prominent throughout the book. And what's interesting is that growing up when I was in high school, especially I think this started when I was 15 years old, I really got into the band Mumford & Sons because they blend a lot of like, I guess you would call it uh, Christian themes with with very like folksy music, but it's mm-hmm. not just Christian themes. It's also like, you know, in their one of their early earlier albums, "Sigh No More." They, they, there's this entire song about one of Plato's writings, "The Cave." So it's, it's I would actually characterize it as like Western more than I would uh, as merely Christian. Mm-hmm. But one of their songs is called "Tim Shell," and Tim Shell is actually written like to pay respects to East of Eden. And when I first heard that song when I was 15 years old, I didn't even know about East of Eden. I just thought it was a really compelling song. But then later on, when I read East of Eden, I realized that this song that they had written years ago was actually in reference to East of Eden. So it was really cool to, to make that connection and see the parallels between the two. And I would, if you don't know that song, I would recommend that you listen to that song to also get a feel for what East of Eden is fundamentally about. What is it called again by Mumford & Sons? Tim Shell, T I M S H E L. It's actually a it's actually a Hebrew word, um, and it will make sense once you read the book. But before you do, I would still encourage you to listen to that song because it's a very beautiful song and it captures the essence of what that book is trying to say. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. I I like Mumford and Sons. I I probably only know three or four songs by them. The more okay. the more prominent ones, but I've always thought they had a great sound. Yeah, and, and going back to Christian music, I got turned off by Christian music really early in my life because the church that I went to mm-hmm. just like what had the typical like old lady singing on the organ looked like she was about to pass away oh. and <laughs> never like and and a lot of Christian music too like a music that is defined under the Christian genre yeah. for whatever reason I just never really 
vibe with it. But I know that there are other bands that incorporate Christian elements like yeah. Mumford and Sons that aren't necessarily branded as gospel or Christian music. So yeah. maybe I need to give it a second chance or just see if there's anything there. It's actually interesting. So I would consider folks like Mumford and Sons, even though their genre of music is not explicitly defined as Christian, I would say that their music is more Christian in some cases than the music that you're describing that are self that's self-defined as quote unquote Christian. Yeah, I always like I never I tr- even try to get into Christian rap too. A lot of the Christian rappers I just didn't think had as good cadences as some of the other rappers that I like that weren't making Christian yeah. music. So I just never stuck to it. But yeah, that's interesting that you consider them Christian as well. Mumford and Sons. Yeah, because they're definitely playing on Christian themes in a lot of their music in the sense that like there's this thread of redemption that's very present in their in their music. And I'm hesitant to call it Christian because what people hear when I say Christian will not be what I mean, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, people, as people do, as human nature, is they will take their associations of Christianity and then they will think that that's what I mean when I say that Mumford and Sons is Christian, but it's not at all what I mean. And so I, for that reason, I'm hesitant to call, call them Christian, but there are very obviously explicit Christian ideas that are mm-hmm. that run through a lot of their music. Same thing for One Republic, mm-hmm. you know? So there are certain bands that are like, interesting in that way but they're not labeled under the under under that title explicitly i'm sure that there are a lot of bands and even solo artists too that i'm listening to that have christian elements in it that i just haven't picked up on or haven't yeah. dissected their music enough and yeah like it, i feel like genre today is kind of almost imploding on itself because there's so many different elements in all different types of music. Like you could have jazz, rock, and hip hop Mm -hmm. all in one track. So when you upload it to iTunes and it goes under hip hop, is it real? Like it could be under three or four different things. And so I find myself more and more just liking the sound, the ways that something sounds, even though maybe I'm confused about the genre. And I, and I think a lot of times I don't even care. I, yeah. I just like the way something sounds first. Yeah. And then if I like the way it sounds, then I'll pay attention to the lyrics. But rarely will I stick around for a song if the lyrics... Maybe the lyrics are amazing, but if, this, if it's not aesthetically pleasing to my ears, if that's the right way to say it, I won't stick around for the message. So that's interesting. So I've had this debate with a good friend uh, for a while about like what's more important in a song, the sound or the lyrics. And I'm such a stickler for a good singer songwriter. Like I'm really into Ben Howard that he's a singer songwriter out of, out of the UK and his work like really inspired me to take up guitar lessons. I agree with you that like if the sound isn't there, then I won't even pay attention to the lyrics because the sound isn't pleasing. At the same time, though, I think if the sound is pleasing, but the lyrics suck, it'll still turn me off. If it's still pleasing and the lyrics suck, it'll it'll turn you off? Yeah. What do you define as lyrics sucking? A lot of current radio pop music. (laughs) Um, Like, if the lyrics are just, like, lacking in depth or are just about something that I find totally uninteresting, like, it's just, like, shallow or bland or or just not interesting, then it won't matter to me, or it'll matter less to me that the sound is a good sound. Now, as someone who, like, you know, sometimes DJs, I have to strike a balance because I know that if a song is popular and if I know that it'll get people dancing, then that's another consideration I'll have to make, despite the Mm -hmm. fact that I might find the lyrics to be ridiculous. So if the beat is like, if the tempo is a certain tempo and... If the tempo carries the day in a in a club situation, then that's one thing. But even mm-hmm. then, I will be very hesitant to play it if the lyrics are just, I don't know, if the lyrics suck. It's not the same thing as yeah. saying, like, I take it back, I take back what I said about shallowness. They can be shallow, but only to a certain point, <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's only so much shallowness I can abide in in popular music. That's interesting because I've been thinking a little bit about this recently too in terms of 
how I get into different modes of mm-hmm. listening to music and how that could affect how receptive I am to the lyrics or just the overall soundscape or both. So w- when I'm working out or maybe I'm going to a, a concert or if I'm using music to change my mood in some way, if, if I'm working out and I want to get pumped up, the lyrics are almost replaceable to me. I I need the beat to like ride me through the workout. And a lot yeah. of times I'll I'll kind of like check back into the lyrics while I'm working out. And I'm just like, that's ridiculous. But the <laughs> beat is fire. And I this is what I need right now. Or I'm at a concert and maybe I'm just in like an uplifting mood and and the vocalist isn't even singing lyrics sometimes. Like she's just making cool sound. So, yeah. so in that sense, I think that the lyrics are almost replaceable to me when I'm in certain uh, moods or, or I have certain goals when I'm listening to music. But then you have on the other hand, like one, one of the CDs that I've listened to for a long time. And I know it's been a long time because I have the CD, <laughs> which no one has anymore. Okay. Uh, but Forest Hills Drive by J. Cole. Every time I go on a drive that's more than two or three hours, especially when I was going back and forth for college, yeah. I would always just listen to that. And I feel like I'm almost in a meditative state when I'm driving because I'm actually... The, the beat is good. Mm-hmm. And the beat is great. I, I love J. Cole's production, but mm-hmm. that's almost secondary to the story that he's telling to me. So I think there's certain states I'm in where I'm more receptive to the story behind the music and then other states where I need the music to carry me, if that makes sense. That's fair. I think for me, it's like, I guess that's true sometimes for me. Like I could imagine exercising and putting on something merely for the beat as opposed to the lyrics. But then again, I know for a fact I have... I have been exercising and been in the middle of listening to a song by Lil Wayne and the beat is amazing and the lyrics are just really stupid and I have to yeah. change, and I just have to change it because it's just not it's not it's not clicking for me like the beat is not enough. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of times I, the lyrics aren't even incomprehensible. Uh, the lyrics are incomprehensible to me and I listen to it anyway or like a lot of the stuff by Young Thug too. I love Young Thug and yeah. half the time like when he gets up into those upper octaves when he's just like da, 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 da. like <laughs> I I don't know what he's saying <laughs> but I know that it sounds cool and I like whatever however it's coming together for some reason just like clicks with me so and not that either one is right or wrong I just think it's interesting how different people perceive music and how that your consciousness at the time may affect how you receive it I will tell you there the genre of Afrobeats is a genre where I could forgive the lyrics for their shallowness more than I could for other genres of music. Because to me, like the beat is so insanely fire that that like I will give the lyrics a pass. But that's like one of the very few genres where I, where I'm aware of that, where I do that consciously. What type of music do you make usually when you're in producer mode? So I coined, I didn't coin this term. That's not true. You could take credit for it. It's fine. I, no one's going to fact check. <laughs> I, it's, just not, it's just like obviously not true. So the first song I ever produced is a song called Imposter. And I labeled it as alternative pop just because like I didn't, my, I didn't, my sense was that it wasn't mainstream pop, I guess. And I, I think most of the things that I produce, I would probably call alternative pop, but like some people would probably just call it regular pop. So it's a sub- subjective, it's a subjective exercise. What sort of inspirations or sounds do you feel like you're pulling on when you're creating alternative pop just to like give a overall picture of it? Yeah, so I am super inspired by gospel as a sonic landscape to play with. I'm super inspired by the idea that if you create a song, you can hear both, let's say, Spanish influences and it and and French influences in it and African influences in it. So I'm Mm -hmm. very much interested in like the combining of different worlds or having the combination of different worlds inform the sound that I create. So like there's this one song I produced called The Fever, Mm -hmm. which sounds like which has a little bit of a African sound in the percussion, but also has a little bit of like, like French in the sense that 
I'm from New Orleans originally, and there's like a lot of like French influences, obviously in New Orleans culture, and so you can hear a little bit of the, of, of like a French second line influence in mm-hmm. some of the percussion of, in, in that song. Um, so again, from a sonic perspective, I like to have world sounds sort of presenting or producing the background of a song, mm-hmm. but also have the song, have the song be something that someone can dance to. And I think that that's what ultimately makes it like pop. Do you put lyrics to it too? Yeah. So most of my songs have, I think, yeah, most of them have lyrics. One of them is not like one of them. I just took a Dr. King speech. I took the last speech that Dr. King ever made because I'm fascinated by the fact that it seems no one talks about the fact that Dr. King was always singing when he gave a speech and people sometimes like, I don't know if people know that or realize that. <laughs> like, I didn't know he, that. Like he would sing inter- intermittently throughout his speeches. Like if you really pay attention to his speeches, he's singing more than he's merely talking. I haven't listened to Dr. King's speech in a while. So I'm going to have to go back and check it out. But I, I, when I've, picture or when I hear him speaking in my head, there's yeah. definitely like a vocal vibrato to it, like yeah. a, a, a musical quality. But no, that's that's a cool thing to pick up on. I never I never really thought about it like that. I'll have to go back and check out more of his speeches. Yeah. So I think that that's one of the reasons why he was so compelling. And this is like, you know, a, a, this comes from the Black Baptist tradition anyway. So you know, it's not like he was the only pastor that did this, but the fact that this was a part of the tradition is partially what made him such a lightning rod and such a compelling dynamic speaker. It was because, in fact, he was singing, not merely speaking. And so one of the songs is just, I take one of his, I take parts of his last speech and I put it to, put it to music in the background. So that's a situation where I'm not, the vocalist it's dr king is the vocalist and i tried to turn it into like a i don't even know how you would describe it honestly but it's uh featuring dr martin luther king (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it's like house music honestly i think at that point that would be the genre for that song so so yeah i like to i think that the use of certain elements of gospel in music is so powerful so like the lion king soundtrack is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time and like the lion king soundtrack makes massive use of that as a technique especially in the song he lives in you which a lot of people don't know about so the song he lives in you is shown at the beginning of line of the second lion king but it's also it's also sung as a part of lion king on broadway and it's such a powerful song that one of the things i've always aspired to do is at least again sonically is to is to like envelop the room in the way that that song, when it comes on, totally like takes up space in the room. Yeah, like it almost washes over you. Yeah, it's like so, it's so compelling. And it's one of the things, one of my fantasies is to one day be able to like, not only produce music, but to, but to direct choirs performing the music and to direct like entire shows where there's a visual aspect as well as a, a vocal aspect. Have you ever listened to Odessa? Yes, I just, I literally just ordered Odessa on vinyl and got it yesterday. I was going to say th- that show, more than anyone, more than any other show that I've been to, their most recent tour, A Moment Apart. Yeah. That show made me feel like I was being washed over by music more than any other live performance I've ever been to. So I can something imagine. about the way that they put together sounds and they also have a huge instrumental aspect to it too because they have the live snare line okay and they have horns on both sides kind of like pillars and i think it's really cool that the way they do the introduction yeah i can can link to it on youtube where they have the snare line and the horns come out first and it's kind of like the like they're leading the battle and then both guys on either side. I'm blanking out on their their names right now, but they kind of like rise out of their respective spots on stage and everyone is holding their drumsticks up on stage at the same time. And it was just like this really powerful moment to open the show. And then the rest of the show followed with similar energy. That's super dope. I always wonder how bands like that prepare 
for like what what is their routine like right before the show starts because i imagine your routine has to be somewhat meditative and transcendent in order to get into that headspace well i can tell you so that show in chicago was the first show that i ever got press pass access to so i was allowed oh, wow. to kind of wander around the the stage in the backstage area mm-hmm. and i knew, i saw the drummers were kind of doing like this dance chant before they went out and i think they were kind of like in this circle thing with everyone else who's going to be on stage. So they were definitely trying to get into some sort of, I don't know if it was a meditative headspace or like pump, pump each other up. It kind of like yeah. reminded me of what rugby players do okay. before they start where it's like the, the stomp and the chant, but they were doing that before they went onto stage. That's cool. So I was just talking to someone the other day, Saturday night actually about like the Samoan tribal chants that happen in Samoan culture. And I remember watching a rugby team that was Samoan do that, as well as seeing a video of that, that sort of like tribal chant being done at a wedding as well. And I wonder, and, you know, going back to Tasha Blank, a lot of Tasha Blank's, a lot of the atmosphere that she curates is like very tribal. Because there's also a live drummer that like plays a djembe during her set Mm -hmm. at different points in, in the set. And that just sort of like whips the the dancers into a frenzy. It's actually very interesting to watch. Yeah. But I wonder if the Odessa percussion folks like do something similar to that because I can imagine that being very powerful. Yeah, they they definitely do do some dance movements while they're drumming, and it's yeah. all it's like in this really cool way in sync where it's kind of like waves going back and forth across the stage. That's cool. So I, I wanted to go back to the, the Dr. King thing for a second with your observation that he almost sings when he's making speeches. Yeah. And that kind of goes off of what we were talking about before is the, is the sound behind the music or the lyrics, the primary characteristic of the music, like which one is pulling people in. So if you think of Dr. King's voice as music, as he's singing, is one of the reasons why he was such a great speaker. The maybe the musical tonations of his voice and, and people were being drawn in by that. And maybe other people that had similar messages were not as powerful as him because they just weren't able to express it in that sort of powerful musical manner. Yeah, it's a good question. In this case, I don't think the the lyrics are inseparable from the instrument. And this reminds me of a tweet I just tweeted last week about my love of hip hop, where I said that what hip hop does with language is makes it one of the most sophisticated art forms of all time. Of course, a lot of people disagreed as is, you know, par for the course. But this reminds me of that, this question, because I think for Dr. King, because he was singing as opposed to just speaking, it's inseparable in terms of the, the substance of what he was saying and how he was saying it. They were, like, they were like one. And yeah, I think that that probably speaks to why he was able to rise as the leader of the civil rights movement as opposed to other pastors who were, who were or other speakers who were saying the same things but weren't as vocally resonant as he was. I would, I would agree. And I think I saw that tweet earlier as I was stalking your Twitter to yeah. prepare for the... <laughs> The podcast, yeah. but yeah, that's a true how the voice becomes the instrument in hip hop, and it's also delivering the lyrics at the same time. So it's like the you're, you're using your voice as the instrument. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I hope that people will, you know, listen to this podcast, and if they hear, you know, Dr. King speak, I hope they will become more sensitive to the fact that he was actually singing and then maybe they will rediscover his speeches in a, in a totally new light. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to look out to uh, look out for that pattern when I'm listening to his speeches again. And, and you also made me think of another, another point. And I, this isn't even really a question. It's more just an observation, but I, wh- I was listening to Porter Robinson the other day, and I think he's one of the best electronic artists at conveying emotions through purely sound because none of uh, there's a lot of his songs that just don't have any lyrics 
at all. But when I listen to his music, for whatever reason, more than most other electronic artists, he hits certain tones or frequencies or combines chords in certain ways that just make me feel nostalgic or sad Mm -hmm. or happy. And there's no, there's no lyrical level to that part of the music that's making me feel that way. So it's like, it was almost making me think of emotions in a scientific way where like, how do you combine these sounds to make someone experience sadness? What decibel level, what, what notes do you have to combine in order to pull sadness out of someone? So I'm so happy you said that because you reminded me of something that I thought about when I first started producing music. So it was sort of a tr- uh, transition. So first I started getting into guitar because of Ben Howard. So I bought my friend's mm-hmm. guitar for like 50 bucks, downloaded. There's this app called uh, Musician, where basically it teaches mm-hmm. you guitar in a sort of video game-like setting. Um, which makes it very okay. intuitive. So I used that to learn basic guitar. And then from there, I just kept progressing to like garage band and being like trying to translate the chords on that were on guitar that were definitely obviously creating very specific emotions and then translating that into like h- learning how to write full songs. And one of the things that I kept coming back to was A minor. And A minor is like one of my favorite chords because A minor connotes both sadness and redemption. And this is what a lot of like gospel does. And also a lot of like some of Bob Marley's songs play with a minor in this way, because Bob Marley could be singing about something that like is both sad, but also redemptive in a way. And the double play of that, I think is fascinating, both from a musical perspective, but also from a just perspective of thinking about the human condition writ large and the implications for how something can be both sad and redemptive at the same time is just very interesting to me. Yeah, because one one is negative. Most people would perceive as negative, I guess, sadness. And then redemption has more of a positive connotation. So the fact that one chord can evoke both of those at the same time means it has to be pretty powerful. Like there's something there maybe we don't understand yet about how we interact with sounds that is responsible for that. Maybe, maybe we are, I'm just not aware of it, but uh, it's cool to think about. I think it also says that actually one is necessary for the other. So it's not even a dichotomy. They're like both interlinked. Like, like you like can't, yin and yang. yeah, like you can't, I, I think ultimately you cannot experience, you can't go through a redemptive experience unless you experience sadness. Okay. I can see that. And that also makes it, potentially easier to experience sadness to know that in advance to know that like the other half of it is actually redemption so uh, this is a a perfect way to segue into theory of enchantment because (laughs) we mentioned dr king we've also mentioned music and i know that you incorporate and you also mentioned lion king too so and i know you incorporate all three of those aspects into theory of enchantment so for people that are not aware, could you lay the the groundwork for what theory of enchantment is and what was the impetus that made you want to start it? Sure. So theory of enchantment is my startup. Uh, it's a framework that I designed to basically teach developmental psychology through pop culture. So I developed this full 25 lesson curriculum that uses pop culture to teach development, developmental psychology. And I sell it to schools through the lens of social emotional well-being. I sell it to corporations and companies through the lens of either HR training, general HR trainings, or diversity and inclusion trainings. And I also sell it to government agencies as an HR training. So that's sort of like at the 10,000 foot mm-hmm. level explanation. But to get more to sort of the fun part, I'm basically teaching people about the human condition using pop culture and how to navigate the ins and outs of the human condition by studying lessons from pop culture. So like we study The Lion King, we study lots of Disney movies to learn about the human condition. We study a lot of hip hop, we study Jay-Z and his book Decoded. We study Kendrick Lamar and a lot of the things he talks about in, in his music. Um, we also study, you know, folks like Brene Brown, who are, who's really famous for like her TED Talk on the power of vulnerability. We study some writings by Cheryl Strayed where she talks about 
parental baggage. Parental baggage is a big theme that we sort of unpack uh, or that I have my students unpack because one of the things that I've noticed when it comes to interpersonal conflict is that sometimes interpersonal conflict erupts when people are overcompensating for the parental baggage that was passed down to them, which is, of course, Mm -hmm. something we talked about earlier uh, with regard to East of Eden, which we also study in the curriculum. Now, in terms of how I developed it, uh, or what was the impetus for developing it, I was at the Wall Street Journal as, as a Bartley Fellow for a year, working under Brett Stevens, who mentored me. Mm-hmm. For nine months, I worked on an 82-page thesis, basically on the topic of like conflict resolution. Uh, my, my major was international studies at the University of New Orleans, so mainly dealing with issues of conflict resolution, but more specifically with regard to Israel, which has been a passion of mine for some time now. And so I was trying to figure out this question of like how to combat anti-Semitism and how to decrease anti-Israel sentiment. Um, And then that question shifted not from, not, it it was about how to decrease anti-Semitism, but then it became, how do I actually get people to love and I realized that there's a difference between those two questions. There's a difference between asking the question of how do you get people to stop hating and asking the question, how do you get a person to love? And then from there, I realized or I asked myself, is it possible to create a system that teaches love using things that people are already in love with, i.e. pop culture? So is there a common denominator amongst some of the most compelling companies and stories we tell ourselves in pop culture, from Beyonce to Disney to Nike as a company to Apple as a company, you know, is there a common denominator in their marketing of their product and in the product itself? And the common denominator that I discovered was that all of these companies and influencers are selling content where their audience sees themselves and their potential reflected in the content. That's all they're doing, basically. And during the, the research process, I read a book called Enchantment by Guy Kawasaki, a former marketing director of Apple. And he defined enchantment as the process by which you delight someone with a product, an idea, or a thing. And that was really, um, you know, in my mind, that was at the heart of a lot of what Disney did. That was at the heart of how Beyonce was able to, you know, compel such a massive audience. That was at the heart of what Nike was trying to do in its advertising. And so I really attached myself to that word and really believed in that word. And that's how I developed the idea of the theory of enchantment. And then to become more rooted, I actually designed three principles that the theory of enchantment was sort of like based upon. And those three principles are number one, remember that we are human beings, not political abstractions, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy. And finally, root everything you do in love and compassion. So that's a little bit about, you know, what the theory of enchantment is and how I developed it in the first place. That's a great synopsis. Thank you. (laughs) I've been working on that. (laughs) Yeah, I can tell. It shows. (laughs) So yeah, it's it's your, I guess, a very, even greater than 10,000 foot analysis would be that you're using common interests to open up the door to inspire more connections with others. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm, what I'm doing is I'm using the stories that, that everyone knows and everyone tells themselves. And then I'm using that as sort of a portal to facilitate the, a greater sense of interconnectedness mm-hmm. uh, between human beings. I think that's a great way to approach it. And I'm sure that, you know, it speaks to the success that you had, you've had as well mm-hmm. and will continue to have. And it kind of make me, makes me think of my experience going to music shows or or a festival. About two months ago, I was at a concert at Brooklyn Mirage. I was seeing Zed. Okay. And I was just thinking about how, you know, maybe there's three or 4,000 people in this space mm-hmm. and no one knows how anyone thinks or how much money someone has or yep. who they voted for. But yet we're all in this tightly confined space sharing the same experience and yep. we're not killing each other. So one of the which things is great. That's, that's wild that you said that because one of the things that I've always that has always um I guess led me to music and you know made me drawn toward music was I was always confounded by the fact that in concerts people are willing to stand as close to each other as possible, people they've never met, um, to get as close as possible to the stage. And I've always thought that that was fascinating in terms of like, 
the people willing, people's willingness to be vulnerable in this particular space as opposed to any other space. Mm -hmm. And one time I was listening to this NPR episode about the history of the term Ole being shouted at like, you know, bullfights. Soccer and games like and stuff that. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's relevant to what we're talking about because it turns out that the history of that is back in, in like a long, long time ago in Spain. I don't know what century, but you can look it up. It's actually on the Wikipedia page if you look up like Ole, Ole, Ole and mm -hmm. where it comes from. So in Spain, when Spain was under, well, let me just set the stage. So, so Spain at some point was under Islamic influences. And so that was sort of like the geopolitical context. And in concerts, when people would see, you know, incredible performances, it would be to them as though they were witnessing like the face of God, basically, uh, or experiencing God in some way. And because Spain was then under Islamic influences, they would chant the name of God in Arabic, which was Allah. And that over time, you know, chanting Allah, Allah, Allah over time became Ole, Ole, Ole. And that's why we have, that's why we have that term today. So I just think it's so fascinating that the experience of transcendence has always been a thing that, that often happens in concert spaces. And so for me, concert spaces are actually deeply spiritual spaces. Um, and I think of that, I think of them, even if there's a secular performer there, I think of those spaces as fundamentally spiritual spaces to be in. There's definitely something that I can't put my finger on, some aura or vibe in the room, wherever, or even if it's outside sometimes, and there may be you know, 20,000 people watching someone perform at Lollapalooza, but just in that space, there's some common linkage yeah. that the music is clearly providing that is overriding our tribalism or like our tribalistic instincts. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, uh, I had this thought uh, when I was preparing for the podcast, like what if before the presidential debates, like whoever, whoever's representing the Democratic side and then Trump on the other side when it's one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. if before the actual debate started, each person just played a song that meant a lot to them. <laughs> and, then, and then they had to explain why. And then they had the debate after, like how would that change the actual debate? That's super interesting because I just started this series and I'd love to have you on it called um, Weed and Wisdom with Chloe. And yeah. the entire premise is we smoke weed and my guest in advance tells me what their top three favorite films are and their top three favorite songs are. And then, and then I study them to prepare for the interview. And then we just talk about why it means so much to the guests and also what are the values that, that are part of those songs that inform the guests' worldview. And the guests, you know, approach to life and stuff like that. So mm. I think that's, I don't know if it would work in the political setting because I could see people exploiting that and being really cynical about it. But I like the mm. idea, you know, generally speaking. Maybe, maybe if Joe Rogan was moderating the debate, <laughs> like when, when people wanted him to, they signed that petition for him to moderate the debate, he would definitely get both candidates high as fuck yeah. and play music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would probably be one of the most televised events. <laughs> it would. People, like, I think that the debates at this point, especially when you have eight to 10 people on stage, it's more of just a political theater because you're not actually arguing a point. You have 30 to 60 seconds to get something in that you memorized. Right. So it's almost like you're acting in a play and people are just trading things back and forth. So you might as well play up the fact that it's political theater and not an actual debate. Yeah. If that's what you want. And then just add crazy, interesting shit to it and more people would watch. That's true. That, that would actually be interesting. Yeah, I can see that as you're describing it now. But yeah, the, the, you said it was called Weed and Wisdom? Yeah. I have to build up my tolerance a little bit before, but that <laughs> sounds like a good time. <laughs> yeah, work on it and let me know. <laughs> So one thing that I wanted to end on is I'm curious about your take on the Joker because I saw that you oh, tweeted a little bit about it yeah. the other day. <laughs> and I also, I also read your article, Whiteness is Blackness and Blackness 
is whiteness. And yeah. I'll, just to preface this, I'll quote part of the article. So you wrote, quote, in the 21st century, we have yet to discover that we are just as selfish and as prejudiced and as fickle as we accuse one another of being and just as capable of love as we deny one another of being. I think that was the last line mm-hmm. in the article. And to bring the Joker into that, I think a lot of people saw the Joker and then associated it with whiteness, which kind of goes against the premise of your article. So I was wondering, from your perspective, what what were your takeaways from the Joker? So I'm not going to tell you all of them because they may be published in an article soon, <laughs> but... That's fine. In the event that part of it is like re-edited, I will read you what I wrote specifically in response to the whole whiteness thing. Yeah, sure. Bearing in mind no, that I completely not- understand about you having to censor your future thoughts. Sure, just 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 in the event that they might be published at a later time. But I'll share this with you just because I, I was very proud of this paragraph. So. <laughs> It says, as a final note, I recently read in a New York Times a piece describing Joker as important for what it said about whiteness. I laughed at this but really wanted to cry since it seemed to me the author had missed the point entirely and did so in an unintentionally deadly way by ascribing to whiteness what is present in all mortals, which is as dangerous as it is ignorant, since it reveals that the author does not know what it means to be human. His complaint that the agency of a white person, corrupted though it may be, by definition obscures that of a black person, reflects a failure to realize that we are all mirror images of each other, black and white, rich and poor, men and women, since we are ultimately humans after all. Our failure to comprehend this deeper truth assists in securing our role as the unsuspecting architects of a society where masks will continue to be worn. When we mock the Joker, we ensure his survival. I look forward to reading that on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt that that will be the case since I didn't pitch it to the New York Times. But um, I did something interesting with this with this piece. I basically took a, without giving too much away, I took a, a poem that was written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar to describe the experience of African Americans right after the end of the Civil War. And the name of this poem is called We Wear the Mask. And so actually a really famous poem in terms of like black history. We um, Wear the Mask. Yeah. And so check out that poem when you get a chance. I, what I do is I talk about the particularism of that poem, but I also universalize it and talk about how it relates to the Joker and, and how we as a society, as human beings tend to wear masks and accuse other people of wearing masks, even though we don't realize that we are also wearers. So yeah, I think it'll be... I think it'll be an interesting piece and um, I think people like will. Can't wait to I read it. A, I think it's a unique angle. So, Yeah, and I would, just wanted to say that w- when you tweeted about the Joker and also uh, you mentioned writing an article about it too yeah. on Twitter, you actually inspired me to go back and make a note on my phone to write an article about Parasite. For, okay. for two reasons. It doesn't it doesn't really have to do with race, at least not right now. But yeah. I just rarely have I seen a movie that I liked and kind of left me confused and r- written about it after. Yeah. And I think it's also a perfect movie to do for me because one, it's insanely popular and won a bunch of awards. And two, I didn't read anything about it before I saw it. And I still have not read any reviews, which is rare because usually I don't have the willpower to not check reviews before <laughs> I see something. Yeah. So I just like that whatever I write about it, the only thing I knew beforehand was that it was a critically acclaimed movie, but I haven't really read anyone's thoughts on it. So you inspired me to try to parse out my thinking on Parasite. Awesome. Yeah, you should definitely do it. That's one of the... F- few films I haven't seen yet just because I know it's disturbing and I have to prepare myself. Well, uh, <laughs> since you haven't seen it, let me tell you how it ends. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. But yeah, thank you. Thank you again for hopping on the podcast. And I, I really do appreciate your time, even with the, the technical malfunctions. I'm glad that it eventually came through, came to fruition. 
Thank you for tuning into this episode of Augzoro. If you haven't already, please hit us with a five-star rating and comment on Apple Podcasts. This helps us appear higher in searches, which means more people will find out about Augzoro. Other ways to help get the word out is telling a friend, tagging us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, writing a blog post, or supporting us with a donation on Patreon. We are a completely independent platform and we're grateful for every listener who supports this podcast. Thanks for coming along for the ride and I'll see you guys next time.